evening. My name is Hayley Jones. I'm a senior lecturer in the College of Engineering and Computer Science. And I'd just like to tell you a little bit about how this talk has come about tonight. I'm teaching a course in systems engineering design and we have a space theme this year. And I was put on to uh, Miriam Boltuk, who is the uh, current director of the Canberra Deep Space uh, Communications Complex. And she told me that she had a couple of visitors coming from NASA and that perhaps they could, to, could talk to our class or even better, perhaps we could give a public lecture. So that's how this has come about. Um, I'd also like to thank the CSIRO for partnering us with us this evening uh, to bring this public lecture to you. So we have two speakers this evening. I'll, um, I'll introduce them as they speak. And if I could ask you to leave your questions until the end. So we'll have the first speaker, then I'll introduce the second speaker, and then we'll have questions at the end. So our first speaker is Badri Yunus, who is the Deputy Associate Administrator for Space Communications and Navigation at NASA. He is responsible for NASA's space communications and navigation infrastructure and services. Mr. Yunus oversees all NASA telecommunications and navigation projects and networks, including NASA's Space Network, Near Earth Network, and Deep Space Network. He's also responsible for the development of enabling technologies critical to meeting the agency's vision for an integrated space communications and navigation architecture aligned with NASA's, NASA's future space exploration needs. Badri is going to talk to us about NASA's vision for space communication in the 21st century and a little bit of the history of the Canberra Deep Space Communications Complex. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, uh, Professor Jones, doctor. <laughs> um, it's a good turnout. Um, were you all required to come here? Will you get credits for, for attending? <laughs> anyway, but it's good to be with you. We, we, we've been here for, for a few days, and uh, it, was, uh, it has been so far uh, quite a trip, uh, uh, both in Sydney and in here. Uh, seen a lot of progress at the Canberra uh, ground station uh, with new added capabilities that we are, we, we are adding over there uh, with the addition of uh, new 34 uh, beam, wave guide, uh, beam wave guide antennas. Uh, as the brochure said, I'm here to talk about the vision for the 21st century. Where are we going to be in terms of telecommunication capabilities and, and infrastructure? But I thought in this presentation also to touch on the relationship that we've had with the Australian government, with all of you, uh, and the history of uh, our relationship from the beginning to where we are now and hopefully where we are going in the future. So uh, my office is new. All the communication um, and communication infrastructure and services have existed for quite some time since the beginning of NASA. There was no NASA without communication. You couldn't send spacecraft, you know, and communicate with sign language with them. You, you, you needed communication uh, to, to establish contact. Uh, so, uh, but the office uh, is recent. Um, in the past, uh, communication used to be driven by specific uh, programs. So, uh, much of the inf infrastructure grew, uh, grew this way, you know, uh, dependent on specific program requirements. And uh, at no time they thought about, you know, uh, combining and trying to harmonize the communication services provided to all of the NASA customers. Uh, until recently, and so th in 2007 they hired me, they asked me to manage the transition of all of our asset infrastructure and services into a unified, uh, fully integrated uh, kind of uh, architecture and capabilities. And the, this gave me oversight and control of the existing uh, infrastructures that, uh, you know, um, the, uh, associated with the following network, the Deep Space Network, which I imagine all of you are familiar with it, and I hope you all have, you know, have visited the, the, the Canberra ground station and seen some of the, the capabilities and some of the science also it, uh, it supports. The Near Earth uh, Network, this is a, a network of ground station distributed around the globe, primarily uh, in the North and South Pole to provide support to Earth's uh, exploration missions. Those are studying the environment and the, and the climate. And also space network. Uh, space network is a, 
consists of a number of data relay satellites distributed around the, the globe in geostationary orbit, providing support, near real time support. Actually, it's real time support uh, to missions that require this kind of support, such as human mission. Um, over the past three years, we've completed uh, the development of the architecture. We also initiated the, the, the programs and the uh, procurement activities for the kind of ca for the capabilities that will lead to the integrated network, and I will talk about that. So, what is the integrated ne network supposed to do? You know, it's driven by uh, a set of requirements. Uh, definitely, among them is the, the to, to unify uh, all of the uh, all of the network to you know unify them and to, to provide support to both robotic and human missions. And why is that? You know. By, by harmonizing, by integrating, uh, there is a, a level of efficiency you can get out of uh, this integration, and you can save some money. And with the money that you save, you can invest into new capabilities. So the networks have, ex you know, that we have, they are pretty old. Some of them are suffering even from obsolescence uh, problems because, you know, they have supported uh, NASA for for quite some time. They have supported the users at uh, proficiency. Uh, higher than 99.99%. So it wasn't broken. Nobody tried to fix them. So, But the technology evolved pretty rapidly over the past few years, and the assets are, were yet, or are yet uh, to, to catch up with the state of technology. At the same time, uh, uh, the appetite for, for more bits and more data rates and more data and higher resolution has grown uh, exponentially. But the capabilities were still you know, far behind. And uh, looking at the, you know, seeing the, uh, uh, the, uh, the benefit of internet, uh, we wanted to carry this aspect to, into space. We wanted to have all of the assets kind of networks. There is no more point-to-point -point, uh, connection. Everything has to be uh, network-based kind of services. And uh, we, they gave me the challenge to pursue the highest data rate feasible. And feasible is a dangerous term because, is it, you know, is it technical? Is it uh, budgetary? Uh, is it uh, uh, kind of uh, operationally uh, feasible? So this is something they left they left up to me to determine. Um, also, uh, we wanted to make sure that we have uh, data communication protocols that will allow uh, you know international uh, interoperability. Um, and uh, because we, we do not operate in space alone, the cost of uh, overhauling the data from, from, from space, be that near Earth or deep space, is not that cheap. It's pretty, pretty expensive. So we wanted to make sure that we piggyback on each other and we provide some level of cross support among all of the agencies involved. And also the responsibility extends uh, throughout the solar system. We, you know, uh, to providing uh, support for mission uh, on Mars, on the moon, and beyond. And uh, we needed to do all of this while maintaining the level of support we are providing uh, uh, to the present set of customer. We need to meet, meet existing uh, customer needs. It's like, uh, you know, driving uh, an old Chevy and you have to convert it to a Lamborghini of the future while going at 90 miles per hour. But that was doable, and we, we've developed the architecture to, to doing that. So what am I talking about? These are the assets, and you can see uh, the, the Canberra site, you know, uh, highlighted uh, in, in, in red over here. But it's a combination of a number of uh, uh, stations uh, providing support either to the geostationary data relay satellites or uh, satellites uh, or stations located uh, uh, up, up north or you know the North Pole or down mm -hmm. in the South Pole provided support to polar orbiting uh, uh, missions and we have an, a whole set of um, uh, ground station much of the much of the support we get here is we procure uh, commercially because we are uh, under a mandate to commercialize services if the commercial uh, market or commercial sector can provide it so a portion of our business depend on the, the availability of commercial providers. So all of these assets, you know, that have evolved over time independently, 
using different technology, different uh, standard, different interfaces. Now I'm being asked to pull them together, integrate them, and harmonize the, 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 the software, the hardware, uh, and pushing the commonality that exists among all of them as high up as, a, as I can. So I established an 80% 80, 80 level of uh, common, uh, commonality among all of them, leaving 20% uh, kind of uh, range for, for you know, the uniqueness of some of the services. Because deep space support uh, is governed by certain laws of physics, same way for near Earth and uh, for uh, providing support from data relay satellite. For, for that, uh, you know, for this kind of uh, uniqueness, 20% will not disturb the, the whole uh, business case for unifying and integrating all of these assets. Definitely, uh, over the past uh, so many years, we have relied on microwave connectivity between the assets and the, the mission that we support. And, uh, but uh, by, the year, by the year 2015, I'm introducing optical communication to NASA's uh, telecommunication infrastructure. It's going to be, uh, we are going to start with uh, uh, some support to a mission. It's a demonstration, technology demonstration, uh, to a mission that we are sending to orbit the moon. It will not be there for too long, but you know, we want to, to see the viability of the link and to gain experience uh, commanding and controlling a spacecraft uh, using optical communication. Still, in terms of uh, microwave uh, connection, we are moving ahead with uh, going up in the spectrum. As our appetite for data rate uh, you know, goes up, uh, so, so does the need for wider capacity, channel capacity to accommodate a high data rate. So we are pushing and we have mandated that uh, all missions flying uh, post-2016 to move to migrate to the KA band. That does not mean we are going to leave the X band and the lower frequency band because they still have their value and, their, uh, and, you know, and they will still be needed for the future. But for all of these missions that require high data rate and need to accommodate, and they, need to be, they need to have uh, much wider ba bandwidths, uh, you know, they need to move up the KA band is, is much larger than the, you know, as you go up in the frequency band, you will have more, more frequencies available to you than at the lower frequency. There is plenty of contention at the lower frequency uh, range. And that's where you see much of your mobile uh, devices, be that broadband or cellular telephony. Uh, they are all competing and uh, there is big contention for that prime real estate, what you know, we call prime real estate in the spectrum. All of this creates a lot of noise, you know. If so you have so many uh, RF uh, devices operating, uh, you know, a certain frequency range, you know, whether in band or around the, the you know, outside those bands, they are going to create a level of interference that might not be suitable for space operation. You know, when we send a, a mission to deep space, you know, the, 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 the signal level received on the ground is pretty small. And later on, you will hear from uh, General Tatini, and will give you a, a certain uh, perspective on how, how small the, that signal. And that's why, you know, it's like listening to someone talking from across the room. The further they are, the, you know, the harder you, you are going to hear them. And so we use some bigger ears, some magnification, some, some cones, you know, to, 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 uh, to try to be more directive toward them and hear them more. So the further you go, the bigger the ear you need. And that's what we get out of the 70 meter antennas. As we started to go move away from Earth, our antennas started to grow and grow and grow. Definitely, there is a boundary after which the cost of implementing these big ears you know, becomes so pro prohibitive. And that's why we are moving to optical uh, communications. Optical communication provide orders of magnitude better performance. It can allow uh, the missions themselves you know, to have more flexibility because you are reducing the burden on them. You have a smaller payload that consumes less power, occupy less volume, and it weighs less. So you have more room to add more scientific instruments on board the spacecraft. So we are making the push toward a technology that can meet the needs in the near Earth as well as the deep space 
And this is the kind of optical uh, technology we, we, we are pursuing. It relies on uh, detecting single photons. Because if you are to operate from deep space, you are operating in a photon-starved environment. You don't have much energy. Every photon counts. So we are working on, uh, on this kind of technology where you can receive single photons. Definitely, the technology uh, you know, involves superconductivity and so on. If you are to, 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 to really detect this kind of low voltage, you need something that's extremely sensitive to this kind of voltage variation. And later on, by the year 2025, you know, we are definitely going to move ahead with uh, optical communication. Uh, you know, still the microwave uh, links will pro will still be provide. You know, the horse uh, the horsepower needed to meet all of NASA's needs. But you know, this is the time we are going to transition. We are going to ramp up in optical communication. At the beginning, we are going to come down to the ground. You know, we have the kind of technology to, that will allow us to penetrate the atmosphere and get uh, adequate reception on the ground. But as we move further and further into deep space, you know, where uh, every single dB start to count, we are going to move with these receivers instead of having them, the, uh, having them on the ground to move them up into ge geostationary orbit, possibly orbit well beyond that at the L1, L2. So uh, the future looks great from a communication perspective, uh, you know, in terms of uh, having the kind of uh, receivers that will allow us to accommodate much higher data rate than, uh, than, uh, than today, and will allow the mission to trade that high data rate with weight and power uh, requirement on this uh, spacecraft. All of this is going to be supported with uh, a communication protocol uh, that's, uh, that's suitable for austere environment where you are liable to have plenty of blockage, blockages and interruption of the signal. And because of the cost of this link, it's pretty expensive. Every, every, every blockage can end up costing you a lot. And because you don't have that many assets, you want to assure that the message that you are sending from Mars, from Saturn, from anywhere, that will make it to its final destination. So we have been working on a, on a new type of protocol that's suitable for this kind of application. Uh, the, the protocol is called disruptive uh, or disruption tolerant uh, networking. And we are working this protocol uh, with, with a gentleman that you all probably have heard of. His name is Vince Cerf. If you, if you are familiar with surfing the internet, he is the father of the internet. So this uh, kind of protocol will provide, will provide us, will allow us order of magnitude better performance than today. It will maximize the virtual capacity that we have by, by, by many times, depending on you know, the environment. And uh, all of this because sometime we are going to send these missions into, into deep space. And some, going to Jupiter, for example, it takes five, six years to get there. So what is the mission requirement uh, you know, change be before you get there? You need to allow uh, for some reconf reconfiguration to take place on board the, the spacecraft. So we are moving more and more towards software-defined radios. We, we are also going and getting into the cognitive radios. And actually, we are going to, into the intelligent radios, radios that can learn by themselves, can adapt, can reconfigure themselves depending on the characteristic of the environment where they are operated. So from a telecommunication perspective, the future looks great. We expect, you know, uh, we have the technology, we have the processing capability, you know, with the Vertex, uh, Vertex 6 and Vertex 7, you have these kind of super duper processors. They consume a lot of energy, but they can manipulate the extreme amount of, uh, or a high, high amount of uh, data and bits. Uh, and all of this is available. And uh, in the ne next year, I will be launching a payload. We, are, we, we used to call it Connect, but it's, most, uh, it's primarily a test bed. It has a number of software-defined radios on board to include a GPS receiver and uh, a few other capabilities that we are going to put on the space station and I have a number of space uh, agencies that we are working with that have already signed up to partner with us on uh, fully exploiting this payload and to test new waveforms and to build up a huge library of uh, waveforms that are suitable to all kind of environment. 
as well as to test a, you know, a whole new set of communication protocols, as well as to advance the radio navigation and the position determination and trying to extract a lot of that to service science and the measurements that we make. And I'm going to speed it up because I know that, uh, okay. So that takes me uh, to the second part, and I know that uh, uh, General Tatini will expand on is the deep space network. The deep space network is, you know, is a major component uh, of our infrastructure. It evolves, uh, it evolved over time, and uh, actually, it among it, it was among the oldest of our network. It started in the 50s. Remember, the early it was the launch of Sputniks. You know, when the Russian uh, the Soviets back then launched Sputnik, you know, that started the space race, and that's when we started. And you'll see later as I as I go through the tally of uh, all of the ground sites that we we, 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 we we built and we collaborated with, uh, with you know with you all with your government uh, is that it was in response to that uh, you know and uh, aligned with that space race. So the DSN. Um, you know, started in the um, late 50s, and it grew to, to encompass uh, three main uh, ground stations distributed worldwide, separated by 120 degrees, and altogether 360. That's full circle. <laughs> so they, they provide around-the-clock coverage to all of the deep space mission. And they're supported not j necessarily just, uh, you know, the deep space mission, but also anything from geostationary all the way uh, all the way up. They are located in Goldstone, uh, uh, California, in Madrid, Spain, and you all know Canberra. Have you been to Canberra? Okay. <laughs> so these are some of the missions that we are, you know, that probably some of you are familiar with, and they are some of the recent ones. But you can see the oldest one is was launched in 1977. Remember VJ? Voyager, uh, some of us believe that it's already went beyond the solar system. Some others that argue now still, still have a few more years to go. But guess what? We are still supporting it. It's so far away that, you know, its voice coming down here, we can only hear it a bit at a time. So when we try to focus our antennas and we use these big ears, the 70 meter antennas, you know, it takes, it takes us a long time to distinguish and to recognize its voice and to start because it takes time to integrate the amount of energy received on the on the antenna and th th therefore uh, you know supporting this mission has been uh, very challenging because it takes a long time on our assets but you know and at one time they they, they made me uh, they, they, they had me or they put me in a position to choose whether to terminate the mission or not because of the cost of supporting it and, you know, so I asked myself the question, what if we make contact tomorrow? Can I bear, can I bear the burden of terminating something that took 20-some years to get to where it is now? I will let it die on its own, and I will keep on supporting this mission as long as I, as I, I can, and we will swallow the cost. It's not a problem. And the most uh, recent, uh, recent mission is Kepler. Kepler is a fantastic mission, and by the way, it's, probably the first mission that we support in KA band, and that shows the transition and our evolution in, in, the, in the frequency spectrum from S to X, now the KA. But uh, Kepler is, you know, is our, our, our eye into the universe, trying to look at other planets to see whether there are other planets similar to, to Earth. And I guess uh, General Tatini will touch on some of that. Additionally, you'll have plenty uh, of missions that you are familiar with some probably such as the Mars exploration and the, some uh, recently we had the uh, messenger, uh, you know, making contact with and uh, being inserted into the orbit of uh, Mercury. So, uh, as I said, you know, it started all with the Explorer, Explorer 1, and it, you know, JPL, uh, J uh, Jet Propulsion Lab, that uh, General Tatini is presently uh, the deputy center director, and um, he can he will elaborate on some of that later, and um, and they they were ready you know as soon as uh, the president you know challenged NASA and uh, the scientific community to respond to 
you know, to, uh, or to, get, to engage in the space race, they were ready to launch uh, Explorer on one. And they, that's where they started uh, the, the build-up of uh, the asset needed uh, to, uh, to, to provide that uh, control and command of the spacecraft. And they looked 120 degrees away from Goldstone. Goldstone was the first site they, they, where they started. And they, they, they saw something like in Australia, prime real estate, people who spoke English, and nice folks too, you know. <laughs> Extremely smart and you can work with, and pretty good allies. And that was a natural choice to, for, 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 for them to, to target Australia. And the relation has been growing ever since. So it started in Woomera. And you, see, you can see in here how some of these stations were driven by specific programs and mission. You know, they were not built to support every mission. Specific programs. And that's why programs were burdened you know, with the cost of every uh, infrastructure or telecommunication infrastructure needed to support their mission. So you know, so you have so much redundancy. Each program will have to pay the cost of its own, of its own infrastructure. So it was it was a costly operation. But back then it was a space race. It didn't money didn't matter. Just spend as much money, but get us there first. And uh, we succeeded, and we succeeded uh, tremendously. And so many of these stations, you see that. Uh, that evolution. We start, we support a mission, we show some success, then we move on. You know, Woomera uh, uh, ceased operation in 1972. Then uh, you had Buchia and uh, Canarbon. Uh, also, same thing, started in the 60s, and they, they closed around, uh, uh, Buchia closed in 64, provided support to Project Mercury, while uh, Canarbon uh, was closed in 1974. Uh, Kobe Creek uh, also, same, same time frame, 1966, uh, and they were providing support to a variety of uh, technology-driven application to include, uh, you know, uh, space observation and uh, environmental measurements. Also, the station did not stay too long. It closed in 1970, and we'll, we'll see why, because we, are, we were building other capabilities elsewhere that were growing and allowed us to integrate much of these capabilities somewhere else. Honeysuckle also was one of these stations that, uh, uh, that came about around the same time frame, 1967, supported the, 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 the Apollo mission. And um, you know, that's where we received the first pictures. You know, as, as you all remember, uh, later on was the, was the parks antenna. Um, they received the first pictures and they heard the first, you know, they were the first to hear the, the astronauts as they landed on the moon, you know. Oral uh, Valley, uh, you know, it's another uh, uh, station that provided support for near-Earth mission, in particular the human space flight. Uh, before we had the data relay uh, satellites that are distributed around the, 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 the Earth, looking down at the missions as they, as they enter the atmosphere and whatever. We had to support them from the ground. From the ground, our visibility of the sky is pretty limited. So we needed so many of these stations distributed around the globe. So the the ORL was you know, one station out of uh, 30 that provided that continuous coverage of human space flight. It closed in 1985 when we had the first data relay satellite launched. Park antenna, it's not part of the NASA you know, uh, infrastructure, but it nevertheless it supported our, uh, our uh, exploration and our uh, programs, as well as our uh, deep space missions. And uh, Ted Bimbela, that's where we are now. The future looks for Ted, uh, Ted Bimbela. The, we, are, we, are, we have made the commitment to invest more money um, in, to build additional capabilities over there. It's going to be uh, homogeneous with the other networks. It's going to have, at a minimum, five 34 beam wave guide antennas. And the beauty about beam wave guide, beam wave guide antennas, they are so flexible and robust. And you, because you have the, uh, you know, much of the feed, you put them at the base of the antennas, and so you can add as many of them as uh, as, as you want. While the other kind of antennas, you had to put them on top of the dish, and you make a new 
lose real estate, and additionally, they are not as flexible and robust. This is uh, Canberra as it looks today. This is where we started uh, last year. We broke ground for the, the location of the new antennas. There will be an antenna uh, completed in 14, another one in 16, another one in 18. There will be five, three, uh, thir um, five 34 uh, beam wave guide antennas in addition to the 70 meter, the existing 70 meter antenna. We don't know what to do with it, but it's going to remain part of the, the capability until we find requirements that will drive its continuous operation. This is our website, so you are all invited to visit it. You'll have much of this information, as well as you get uh, to see the technologies that we are evolving. And I hope uh, you know some of you will get into, into this line of work and pursue this kind of discipline from RF system engineering to technology development. If you do so, call me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Baju. That was really interesting to hear about how you move forward with the technologies into microwave and optical and uh, changing the protocols as well. Okay, I'd like to introduce our second uh, speaker for the evening, uh, General Jean Tatini, who is the Deputy Director of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at NASA. He's responsible for the day-to-day -day management of JPL's resources and activities, including managing the laboratory's solar system exploration, Mars, astronomy, physics, earth science and interplanetary network programs and all business operations. Uh, Jean is going to talk to us about NASA's vision for robotic space exploration and we should, we should bring up your talk, shouldn't we? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Good evening to you all. It's a, it's a real privilege for me to be here with you tonight. I, uh, I'm a retired Air Force guy, I spent 36 years in the United States Air Force, the last 20 some doing military space things, and then I transitioned over uh, into the Jet Propulsion Lab and, and a follow on career that has been absolutely marvelous. I tell you that uh, only to say that I've had the privilege of being in your country many, many times, both with my Air Force hat on as well as with my, my JPL hat on. And uh, it, is, it is a marvelous, marvelous place. And uh, I try to get back as often as I possibly can. It's interesting, you, you know, you realize that, that my colleague Badri uh, came from the headquarters of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration in Washington, D.C. And like a typical headquarters guy, he pointed out at least four things that I'm going to talk about, but then took all my time. <laughs> so <laughs> we will, we, by, by the way, when we have an opportunity uh, to talk with younger people at the high school, high, of high school age and talk about what they want to do uh, when they go to university, I, I counsel two things. I say, you know, one, if at all possible, you should try to get an undergraduate degree in applied physics. And you should understand calculus. You do those two things, you can solve the mysteries of the universe. And then as I later on, as, as I've been into this, I do an addendum, and I said, in addition to that, you absolutely have to take a systems engineering course at some point in your career. So we go from there. Uh, let me press on with this, if I may. I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges of interplanetary deep space uh, exploration, and then I'll give you a preview of what's happening uh, within the National Aeronautics and Space Administration relative to the JPL portfolio of launches as we go forward paid political advertisement for JPL. It was founded as, as an operating division of the California Institute of Technology back in the mid-1930s when Professor Von Karman brought some of his students into an arroyo in Pasadena, California to do rocket research, both solid and liquid propellant rocket research. Uh, that was right at the very, very beginnings of the Second World War. We morphed into an Army Research and Development Lab doing a lot of rocket research uh, into the Cold War, again doing uh, a lot of anti-aircraft missile rocketry kinds of things with surface-to-air missiles, Sergeant, Nike Ajax, those kinds of things. And then in October uh, 1957, the then Soviet Union launched Sputnik, 
It certainly changed the way the entire world looked at space, especially the politicians and especially those in the military. January of 1958, uh, Caltech at the time, with its, with its JPL operating division, launched the first United States Earth orbiting artificial satellite, Explorer 1. That put the United States into space under the Eisenhower administration in 1958. They passed what we refer to as the National Space Act. It reassigned the Jet Propulsion Lab then from an Army Research and Development Lab to the newly created uh, National Aeronautics and, and uh, uh, Space Administration. That's where we are today. That's what Caltech does. We are a federal lab. Uh, all of the desks, the chairs, the tables, the land, the buildings are owned by the federal government. All of us that have the privilege of working at JPL are university employees, okay? And we all work for, for Caltech. And, and as I tell people, there are only two people at the Jet Propulsion Lab that don't have a, a doctorate degree. You know, the deputy director, me, and the janitor, okay? <laughs> The, the difference is the janitor is working on his dissertation as we go forward. <laughs> so I am, I, am, I am not the scientist here with you this evening. Now on the next slide just to, tells you where the, uh, where the Jet Propulsion Lab is today. We are operating 19 spacecraft as we visit this evening and nine major instruments. As we go forward, I'll talk for a minute about the Dawn mission. I'll talk about where we are in Mars. I'll talk about the Stardust Next program. And I'll talk about the Deep Impact uh, mission that we recently concluded. But as Bodry pointed out, uh, we have a number of spacecraft uh, both in orbit around our particular planet or in orbit around Mars, in orbit around uh, 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 Titan. And uh, we also have those two Voyager spacecraft somewhere out there. Uh, there. There is a debate as to whether or not they are still under the influence of the star that, uh, that we are under the influence of or whether or not they are in deep interstellar space. Uh, we, we're not sure of that. But I will, I will talk about that. Now before we get to that, Let's talk for a second about some of the challenges. Probably when you're talking about deep space exploration, distance and time are your two greatest enemies. And this just gives you some idea of how long it takes to transit 100 million miles from Earth uh, to Mars. And uh, if you were with Lewis and Clark as they explored the Northwest Passage of the United States with their canoes and on foot, it would have taken you about 40,000 years. Uh, if you were with Columbus as he sailed to the Danina de Pinti and the Santa Maria, it would have taken, what, about 10,000 years. That, that Z240 is a little sports car that belongs to my boss. He <laughs> claims that it'll go 55 miles an hour. I don't think so because it's about a 1968 uh, vintage sports car. At 55 miles an hour, it would take him about 175 years to make the trek uh, from, uh, from this planet to the planet Mars. Even today, when we launch the Mars Science Lab on the 24th of November of this year, with all of the energy and the specific impulse generated by a Delta IV heavy rocket uh, launch vehicle, it will still take over nine months to get from here to Mars, realizing that the only way we can do that is once every 24 to 27 months as the, as the planets line up and give us that kind of a launch opportunity. That is a real challenge to us today, and it is a real challenge to those folks who have to pay for the launch vehicles that get us into space. And if there's any one of you out in the audience today that can come up with a big slingshot that doesn't cost a lot of money to get us up there, we'll buy one from you, okay? Now, the next part of this is navigation. And, and navigating in interstellar space is, is something that very few people can do well. And that's one of the core competencies of the Jet Propulsion Lab. When these men and women uh, worked the, the Mars Exploration Rovers, both Curiosity and Opportunity, they traveled 400, 450 million miles and put us at a point of, of entry into the Martian atmosphere, plus and minus about 80 meters of where we should have been. Okay, and, and that like to use a golf course analogy, that's like teeing off at the Royal Course down in Melbourne and putting a golf ball on a green at St. Andrews close enough for a tap-in birdie, okay? 
while both, both the T and the green are also moving at about 60,000 uh, miles per hour. <laughs> That's what the JPL navigators are capable of doing. And how do they do that? They do that with mathematics, okay? So tell that if you, if you have youngsters at home, if you have grandkids at home like I do, tell that to those folks, okay? It is all the power of navigation. Now, Baudry indicated to you that I was gonna talk a second about communications. This is just the example that we use. Of course, we have Cassini in orbit around Saturn uh, as we visit this evening. If you transmitted uh, with a 40 watt transmitter over a billion miles from Saturn back to the Earth, okay? You would, and I'm gonna have to put my glasses on to look at this. By the time that 40 watts of transmission got to the Earth, it would be one billionth of a billionth watt, okay? You take that one billionth of a billionth, of, of a billionth watt then, and it would take 200 quadrillion, okay, or 15 zeros after the 200 <laughs> to provide enough wattage for a 30 watt refrigerator light bulb. And it is that kind of capability that the men and women of the deep space networks, not only here at Canberra and Tidbin Villa, but also in Spain and also in California can do. And as with their large antennas and with the technologies that they bring to bear there. Remember that you cannot fly in interstellar space without bringing the information back. It would be a waste, waste of everybody's time. So let me go through a couple of recently completed missions. There have been, in our history, only five comets that have been imaged by a flyby spacecraft. Of that five, the Jet Propulsion Lab assets have imaged four of them. Uh, one of them is shown here on the slide. This is a comet Halley 2. Uh, it is the fifth and most recent comet that has been imaged by a flyby spacecraft, something we call Epoxy-1. This was done in November of last year. What we did is we recycled the deep space uh, spacecraft, and I'll talk some more about that on a subsequent slide, and the navigators took it and said, we think there's enough fuel left where we can reorbit this thing and get a flyby of, uh, of Halley 2. It's the first time that a single spacecraft, the deep, the deep impact spacecraft, has imaged two different comets, okay? So that's, that's one mission to a comet. The other mission to a comet is something we call Stardust Next. And on, on Valentine's Day of this year, Stardust Next then flew by uh, the comet Temple 1. Temple 1 was a comet uh, that was impacted by a projectile launched from the Deep Impact spacecraft on the 4th of July 2005, okay? And we then took the spacecraft, reoriented it, flew it through uh, both in a photographic mission as well as a spectroscopy mission to try to understand what the ejecta was like coming out of the crater that we caused. And then five years later, we went back to that and re-imaged it again with the Stardust spacecraft. And what you see up here on the slide on the next view graph is an image on what would be on your right of the Deep Impact spacecraft and on your left the Stardust Next spacecraft and the, the, the orientation that the space navigators had to make uh, to geolocate uh, the crater on, uh, on, on the comet from both of those different uh, uh, camera, camera angles and images, okay? And what these folks found then is that there has been very little change over the five-year period of time to the crater impact, and although they do see a little bit, the two craters about 300 uh, meters in depth help the scientists locate the areas hit, hit by the impactor, and they talk about a composite image. It is about 100, and the image shown in the middle, uh, there's a bright dot right up here, gives you some indication as the subsurface of that particular comet. So that's, uh, that's the two, two uh, astro I said comet, the two asteroids that we looked at. Now let's turn our attention uh, to the Cassini spacecraft as it orbits around Saturn. Uh, this particular uh, image uh, talks to uh, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the moon Titan, and uh, I think we're up now, uh, the Cassini mission has discovered in the, in the neighborhood of about 52 uh, moons in the Satyrian system, Titan being one of the more interesting 
because of the methane there, there for, for many, many years, for about the past 20 years or so, the scientific community uh, was conjecturing, the hypothesis was it did have liquid methane lakes on the surface of the moon Titan. And then in, uh, on the 22nd of January uh, 2006, when we then took these images, that confirmed uh, that scientific hypothesis. And uh, in, in fact, on the planet Titan, there is a climatological cycle. Uh, it actually rains there. The difference, just like it does here on our planet, the differences are it rains methane, methane lakes. And just one of the other things that I might point out, this is the radar image that has been unprocessed, if you will. And then what you look at on your right is a processed colorized image that helps us visualize a lot better the scientific information uh, that we're getting back from the Cassini spacecraft as we go forward. Now, <laughs> one word about Earth science. And it's been interesting listening to your news uh, the last uh, several nights on your release of a study uh, relative to climate change. We're not going to get into that this evening. We are not going to talk about that. But what we will talk a little bit about is what uh, space-borne instrumentation uh, can bring uh, to the debate and, and change a lot of conjecture to fact as we continue to develop the climatological record in, in these areas over a long enough period of time where we can draw some, some uh, uh, very good, uh, uh, highly competent uh, scientific opinion. Uh, if you'll just start up on, the, up on your left and you walk your way through, uh, the AIRS instrument uh, measured global temperature. Uh, you do an awful lot of ozone tracking with that, uh, with that particular spacecraft. Uh, Jason will give you global uh, sea height. Uh, Grace uh, is a gravity mapper of this, uh, uh, of this planet. Uh, GRAIL, which I'll talk about in a moment, is an upcoming gravity mapper of the lunar surface using the same technology. Uh, you go up here, QuickScat uh, will give you surface winds. So you have ocean height, ocean temperature, winds over the ocean. Uh, you can do an awful lot of scientific investigation with those kind of data points. Jumping down to Miser, uh, get Miser gives you aerosol. Uh, tests will give you uh, ozone. Uh, MSL will give you stratospheric chemistry. And then finally, uh, CloudSat, uh, which is the latest one we have, gives you, gives you moisture profiling uh, in the clouds on a uh, on a, 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 a vertical slice, okay? So that's just a taste of some of the Earth science missions that JPL and the NASA have flying today to try to answer these kinds of questions and, and better develop the modeling on some of these kind of questions that are being debated by, by your government today, uh, at least on the TV and in the media as we go forward. Now, let me, this, is, this is what we're doing. This is what we have done. Let me switch gears here and talk for a second about what's going to happen within the next nine months uh, from a JPL perspective alone. And in the next nine months, we're going to launch four, five separate missions and have a fairly major encounter uh, with a spacecraft called Dawn. And uh, we'll just let me take you through those, if I may. The first is something called Aquarius. It is a sea salinity. Uh, spacecraft developed in conjunction with the Argentinian Space Agency, uh, uh, an organization called CONI. Uh, we developed the instruments, uh, the folks down in Argentina, uh, Argentine, Argentina, uh, developed the spacecraft itself. It was assembled in South America, and there is a picture of it being assembled, crated, uh, shipped via, via uh, C-17 from Brazil. It is now at Vandenberg Air Force Base, uh, undergoing uh, a, a number of tests as we, as we build the spacecraft up, integrated on a Delta II, and then it will launch, uh, it will launch on the 9th of, uh, of next month. And it'll go into a polar orbit, and it'll give you a lot of information on, on ocean salinity, which gives you information on density, and then you, you draw conclusions from there. Probably one of the more interesting missions that we have coming up is something called Dawn. Dawn will orbit two, ma the, two of the most massive asteroids in the asteroid belt. It, uh, it would be the first sp uh, spacecraft to rendezvous uh, with a main, uh, main belt asteroid. 
It inf it'll be the first spacecraft to ever orbit uh, two different asteroids in the same mission, and it will also visit uh, Ceres, which uh, we think uh, we define now as a dwarf planet. Uh, what enables that is, is ion electric propulsion, and uh, the spacecraft was launched in September of 2007, and then on the 16th of, of July of this year, it will be captured by the gravity field of Vesta and go in orbit around Vesta for about a year, leave Vesta, go to Ceres, and go in orbit around, uh, around Ceres. That, uh, that is something that uh, we are really looking forward to, probably as a, in an engineering perspective, uh, but not as much as the scientists are looking forward to some of the information they'll get back from there. Uh, Juno, this is the cover of uh, Aviation Week in March of this year. Uh, a very, very good image of the, of the Juno spacecraft. Uh, Juno is a solar-powered spacecraft. It will go further into our solar system uh, with, uh, with solar power than any other spacecraft that we have ever flown. Uh, that's another way of saying that there is a massive array of uh, solar panels on this particular uh, spacecraft. It is down at, uh, it, it was uh, built at uh, Martin Marietta uh, in, uh, I'm sorry, it was built by Lockheed Martin in uh, Denver, uh, Colorado. It is now down in, uh, in Florida uh, going through its, assembly, its uh, final checkouts in preparation for launch next year. Uh, this again will show you a picture of the vault, all of the instrumentation because of the radiation fields around the planet Jupiter are captured in a vault. Uh, this is the vault that is open now on a, on a turntable. And then the, one of the solar wings is shown there on the right. It'll give you some idea of the size of this particular spacecraft as it goes to Juno. Uh, it's about a, a, a six-year transit uh, to the planet uh, because of the radiation environment that it will fly through. Uh, we have a one-year mission planned uh, for Juno around the planet Jupiter as we go from there. Now re recall now, we've gone, we're going, this, this is not going to happen in years. This is going to happen in the next several months as we go through this. And one of the big issues as a deputy director to Jet Propulsion Lab is, what if I have an off-nominal condition in one of these spacecraft? How do we work our engineering community to make sure we can, we can problem solve while at the same time continue to meet the launch, uh, launch windows uh, that I'm going to continue to talk to you about for just a second. So that was Juno. Uh, we, we talked about GRACE and the gravity mapper around the Earth. This is GRAIL. GRAIL is two small spacecraft that will fly in formation around the lunar surface and give you a lot of indication as to the gravity field on the moon, which gives you an awful lot of indication uh, in terms of what's going on in the subsurface areas there. Uh, the principal investigator for this is a professor at MIT, uh, and uh, the individual that's doing the education and public outreach is the first uh, female Air, uh, United States astronaut in space, a woman by the name of Sally Ride. Uh, so you will see a lot of that as we go forward. Now, the, the, the probably the sum total of the missions that we talked about here, dollar-wise, is in the, the billion to a uh, billion and a quarter uh, dollars in terms of uh, U.S. taxpayers' resources. I'll now talk about the Mars Science Lab program. This is about a $2.3 billion program that is being executed organically uh, to the Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, what we show here is the rover family. On your right is Pathfinder, uh, the first uh, uh, one of the rovers that we, we actually landed on the surface and operated. Uh, that's about the size of a, of a, uh, a bread box, if you will, or a, a swimming pool sweep. In the middle is one of our two rovers, Spirit and Opportunity. Uh, that's about the size of a golf cart. And then uh, on the far left, on your far left, is our Mars Science Lab program. In a naming contest, uh, it has been named Curiosity. So as it launches and flies out to Mars, you will hear it referred to by that name in instead of the Mars Science Lab program. But that just gives you some idea of the size. Uh, this is Curiosity in our uh, spacecraft assembly facility at the Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, this will, it'll launch 
on the 24th of November, the 25th of November, the day after Thanksgiving, uh, on a Delta IV, as I mentioned, uh, from the Kennedy Space Center uh, in Florida. And uh, if you, there, there is, there is a, a webcam, well, it's, it's, uh, we're, we're just getting ready to ship, but you can get on a webcam at JPL and watch the activities in our spacecraft assembly facility. Uh, this is a little bit about uh, some of the mobility testing uh, that we have. This is in its flyout configuration. On the top is the cruise stage, the back shell, and then the heat shield. Gives it, and the, 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 the rover itself is kind of in an origami uh, fold inside of there. This is how it is going, it's going to sky crane down to the surface. Uh, we'll release it, we parachute it down the sky crane, then activates and there are retro rockets that fire. The, uh, it is lowered from the sky crane. Uh, once the sensor sense impact on the Martian surface, uh, some explosive bolts will fire, the sky crane will fly off. And voila, we're doing science on the surface of Mars uh, for hope, what we hope will be many, many years. But there's wet chemistry there, a lot of biological kinds of things on the surface. Now, you can't do any of this without the Deep Space Network. The reason we're here today is because of the DSN, and Badri again talked to you a lot about that. The DSN is looked at as an infrastructure program. We fight every day for resources to get that. Now my final slide is kind of a mix of technology, art, engineering, and science. Uh, this is the Crab Nebula. It was first observed on Earth in the year 1054 AD, and uh, it is basically the remains of a supernova, if you will. Uh, it is about 6,000 light years away, so when the Chinese first saw it in, uh, in 1054, it actually happened about 5,000 years before Christ, okay? Uh, I won't go into some detail because she's given me the hook here, but <laughs> what, is, what is interesting about this particular image is that the, the light blue there is, is from the uh, uh, Chandrayaan X-ray telescope. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope uh, optical image is in the green and dark blue. And then our Spitzer uh, telescope, which is in the infrared, uh, provided the image in the, in the red as we colorize this and, and put this together. So uh, with that, I thank you very, very much for your attention. And uh, I look forward to Badri answering all the questions. Thank you. <laughs>
definitely they do, they do not co cost a dollar or two. You are talking billions of dollars. And we, you know, safety of property and the protection of this investment is our responsibility to the taxpayers. You might say a word to the privatized launch field. Oh. It's a new endeavor. <laughs> Uh, we we expect to get a competitive uh, rate, and uh, definitely the commercial sector in the past, uh, when when challenged, um, you know, was able to respond in a very efficient way. So we are hoping that this will be the case, and will reduce the cost of uh, launch, uh, you know, the launch cost to, to to NASA as well as to the commercial sector. Power is going to come from RTGs. It's going to be it's going to be nuclear powered, plutonium 238, and uh, uh, the facts of the matter are, you know, with with the rovers themselves, uh, the uh, Spirit and Opportunity, we thought that the failure mode was going to be that the Martian dust was going to cover uh, the solar panels and in fact uh, end its life that way. And we were absolutely wrong there because we didn't anticipate the little dust devils that acted as a broom and swept the uh, uh, swept it clean. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is, though, the instrument suite that we have on MSL has to be nuclear powered in order to do the kinds of science we'd like to do on the surface. In, in addition, we are looking at the five year of five years of operation, yeah. and for that, you really need kind of uh, this Although kind of power generation. The rovers are in their seventh year of operation. Uh, what would I like to see next? Yeah. Well, we, we, there's, there's, there's a couple of three things. You know, one, uh, we, would, we at JPL uh, would love to see a, a large radar program uh, that'll do a lot of natural hazard kind of work for us. Uh, we would also like to see a fully funded uh, flagship outer planet uh, mission uh, to the moons of Titan and the Jovial uh, system. And third, uh, if we were, you know, if you, if I was king for a day, we'd also like to have some kind of nuclear-powered uh, spacecraft. That's the only way you're ever really going to get humans uh, out of low Earth orbit and uh, and into Mars and other places. Sorry, you mentioned uh, something about intelligent radios, self-configuring radios. Can you give us a bit more at what stage of development are they at? Well, the cognitive radio. Uh, it's essentially a radio that can adapt to its environment. Uh, it's, uh, we have it in the lab and should see the day of light or the light of day <laughs> uh, within the next two to three years. The, the intelligent radio is a concept that will take that further uh, to, you know, and uh, I expect it to be ready by the, by the 2020 time frame. Did I answer your question? It's, it's, it's a radio that can work with its environment, collect data, and make its own decision by itself. While the cognitive, it, it, it's a radio that can adapt. You know, you have some, you know, some adaptive processes that will, uh, will allow it to adapt to the environment. So it's in between the, the software configured kind of uh, dumb radio and the extremely smart. Uh, and the software defined radio is as good as the, the programmers and our ability to reconfigure it on the fly. I, I did not hear this. Oh, you have uh, my apologies. Uh, if something goes wrong, you've got you know radioactive stuff flying around everywhere. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> you go all the way uh, to the White House to get launch approval for an RTG uh, powered mission, and and we have done analysis after analysis after analysis in terms of the safety of that particular launch and how it would stand both on pad accident all the way through an accident as it, 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 as it uh, goes into the uh, third stage burn. So that's, that's, that's how you do it. The, the answer is very carefully. 
all of them. You know, safety and, uh, you know, is uh, definitely among our first priorities. That's why everything we do is very expensive because it goes through a number of redundant kind of processes to ensure uh, the safety. So even if an explosion to take place on board the spacecraft, that particular module is protected. Will not leak, will not, uh, you know, uh, how to say it, diffuse any of the energy that com it contains. Why do I? What if you've got the three tracking stations? But oh, fails? because we are we are not the only ones that uh, operate and support deep space uh, mission. We rely, we piggyback on the on capabilities um, that provided by other space agencies. If we cannot do it with the two remaining uh, stations, and um, for the most part, uh, we have been able to meet our own needs. You know, and the load that we have on the network with two, uh, with two stations, just uh, you know, in case one of them uh, shut down and unable to provide that support. Again, if we have critical maneuvers and we require coverage at a certain point in space that cannot be uh, provided by the other two stations, we talk to the Japanese space agency, we talk to the Indian, we talk to everyone, and we we, we build we build that into our schedule. But there there are critical kinds of that you want to make absolutely sure you have coverage of. So what you try to do in that regard through our, through our navigators and, and, the, and the guys who do the orbits is put that in a view of more than one station at any one time. But you know there's so, re so much redundancy out there also that a complete failure of, of a station, both with its 70 meters and, and its 34 meter antennas, is, is fairly remote. It, do it does happen, but it's... it's yeah, most remote. stations have more than just one antenna. And uh, when you have critical maneuver, they take the highest priority in terms of support. So there are always assets to provide that coverage and that support. Uh, I think we just have one more question. Um. I'm wondering if, if there's ever been an experience of an impact with one of your spacecraft from one of a small rock or something in space. Sorry, can you say that louder? <laughs> if, if there's been an, an impact with a spacecraft from some sort of debris in space or rock or whatever. Oh, sure. Well, I don't know for deep space mission. To have well, I mean, you, most most of this you worry about in, is in low Earth orbit and in, in uh, up to geo. Uh, you do have micrometeor hits all the time. Uh, we have, as a matter of fact, we brought back a piece of the Hubble Space Telescope and examined it, and it was just peppered with micrometeorite hits. Uh, we had the, the two uh, communication satellites uh, that uh, we almost had a collision with. Uh, that has opened up a lot of cooperation in the in the in this the, the private sector in terms of a lot of what they're doing there. The, the Air Force Space Command has a lot of ephemeris cataloging information now to try to avoid those kind of things. It's getting crowded up there in certain certain parts of the geo belt, and you, you do have to watch that. Yeah, to to add to what the general is saying, every time we fly the shuttle, it comes down. We can see the impact of these little even a speck of dust and up. Uh, you know, the um, on orbit can you know with something going at twenty thousand um, miles per hour can cause uh, some some damage, and we have an active program to track every single you know p you know a speck of dust up th up there. We track it down to the the millimeter level, and we try to avoid the areas where there's plenty of debris. And uh, we have an active program now to to do more uh, more detection and tracking of these. Uh, from near, we call them debris, uh, but for the most part, they are near Earth objects that are floating in space. And we try to also avoid situation where collision may take place to, you know, between two space assets that will create more of these debris. But definitely, our, we have plenty of eyes that looking up to ensure that, you know, as our spacecraft crisscross the, 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 the heavens, they avoid the, these debris, on, you know, that could be on the way. I think we'll have to uh, call it a day there, so please join me in thanking our two speakers.